the Revolution will be televised. Welcome to a live event at Lemoyne Owen College. And there is something, when I knew I was going to do this event, there was something, Brunel, I knew that I wanted to do. So you all have to forgive me. Finally, Brian Clay, class of 92, has come back to Lemoyne Owen College. Let's give ourselves a hand. I'm a graduate of uh, Lemoyne Le Owen, class of 92. Hello, Ms. Rodney. Uh, he majored in political science, was the editor of the paper here, president of the NAACP, uh, ran track here in all America. So this is home to me. So it is so good to be with all of the journalism students and, and all of my brothers and sisters that will be future alone. Wait a minute. Let me say this again. Future alums of Lemoyne Owen College. Am I right? Y'all yeah. yeah. don't sound too enthused. Yeah. Let me say this yeah. one more time. Future alums yeah. of Lemoyne Owen College. Yeah. We have got a wonderful, wonderful program with me. Standing next to me is my brother, uh, my boss, uh, because we're on Tri State Defender uh, Media TV, which will this will air, people. Uh, all week, all week long. He is a graduate of Rhodes College. He is the CEO of the new Tri-State Defender. He owns that company, people. This is a uh, And uh, Brian, first of all, I want to say I'm about to take you everywhere I go. Okay. My introduction. Well, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I am glad to be here on the campus of Lemoyne Owen. As he mentioned, I, uh, when I was at Rose College, he was here in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, I spent a lot of time on this campus, although I did not graduate from here. Proud of what Lemoyne Owen means for the city of Memphis. Mm -hmm. Just understand that this is a jewel in our community. Mm -hmm. The work that's going on over here to educate young African Americans is what will make Memphis into a great city. Mm -hmm. So we want to invest in this college, invest in this uh, resource here in this community, and we want, as much as we can, the new Tri-State Defender, TSD Television, and all of our media partners, the Brian Clay Chronicles, and all those that we partner with, will make sure that we highlight and bring uh, to, to knowledge and information to the world uh, all the great things that are going on here at the Moon on College. So I don't want to belabor us. We want to get right into this because this is a tremendously important discussion. I'm going to put you back in the hands of Brian Clay Chronicles. This is a taping of the Brian Clay Chronicles that will air on our internet television network, which is TSD TV. It's available through our website, which is tsdmemphis.com. If you're not already signed up for our email distribution, or if you're not already reading uh, our newspaper, either in print or uh, the digital version, we send out a digital daily version that goes out to now. We have about 35,000 people subscribed to our uh, email. Please go to our website, tsdmethods.com, and download our mobile app. If you got if you got an iPhone, if you got an Android, you can download our mobile app. Go to your uh, Play Store or App Store and search for Tri-State Defender and download the mobile app. Uh, thank you for having us here on the campus of Lamar North College, and we look forward to a phenomenal, uh, robust discussion about voting and about politics. And young people, we really want to hear from you today. So we're going to hear from our panel, but we definitely want you to be prepared and ask questions and give your input, so we want to hear from you. Thank you. We're gonna we're gonna go to our panel, but one of the things that I do on a daily basis is brag about my alma mater, Lemoyne Owen College, and I know some of the finest students in America go here. So this is gonna be an enthusiastic uh, uh, effort today. So I want you all to kind of lay back, um, get your questions on, and give yourselves another applause, and I wanted an enthusiastic applause because you got some of the finest political pontificators, the political mavens uh, in the city, and I want you all to ask tough questions. So <coughs> give, give yourself a hand. Okay. Uh, 
right, now what we're going to do, we're going to let the panel introduce themselves. Uh, we're going to start right here with my brother, uh, Kyle Beasy. Go ahead. Hey, I'm Kyle Beasy. I'm the uh, politics editor at the Commercial Appeal. Been doing that for about a year and a half, and uh, I've gotten a little, a lot of, I was a sports writer for 10 years. So I came into this about a year and a half ago, got to know a lot of good people in the process, like Brian. So uh, right now we're in the thick of it with the election season, so um, that's kind of what I do, and it's what I do 24-7 right now, as Liz could probably attest to. Okay. Good morning. Uh, thank you for having us to your awesome college today. I'm Liz Rincon. I uh, work for a political strategy firm based here in Memphis. Uh, actually, one of my coworkers is right there. Hi, Lawrence. Uh, Got me a Diet Red Bull because it is the thick of a political season, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you so much. <laughs> thank you, Lawrence. Okay, round of applause for Lawrence for the <laughs> some political science courses as well. I'm delighted to be a part of this panel uh, and dealing with such a meaningful time, and that is the watershed of voting in that sense there. So I'm looking forward to listening to, <laughs> learning from, and participating in uh, these uh, great discussions today. Uh, good to see you. <laughs> Raise your expectations. If you don't know about it, check it out. It's hot. It's current, and we do cover a lot of territory. Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name is Chris Evanston, President and CEO of Global Innovation Now. My company, we create mobile apps for businesses. Uh, currently, we have 30 apps in the iPhone and Android market year to date. Uh, and the last one we did was a uh, Cooper Young, Cooper Young, so it's in the iPhone and Android market. Just working with businesses, it's all about connecting businesses. And uh, so I'm inspired to just teach these kids and, 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 and talk to you about that and shed a little light on voting and politics as well. Thank you. My name is Noel Hutchinson. I'm the pastor of First Baptist Church Lauderdale, right across the street from Booker T. Washington High School here in South Memphis. That's right. Somebody ought to give a shout out to South Memphis. All right. And I also live in Soulsville. Somebody ought to give a shout out to Soulsville. Yeah. And beyond that, I am the TV host of Black Thought, which is on the M1 Network. You can watch us on M1TVNetwork.com Mondays and Wednesdays at 10.30 a.m. And I'm the recent host of Black Thought Unplugged. Matter of fact, I'm going to be on today, 
5 p.m. at a.m. 7.30, so you can check it out. And also, for y'all that's in Dr. Pate's class, I'm going to be the one that's praying for you to get an A. So you better check it out. It's a great watershed. Mm -hmm. Anytime you deal with uh, uh, history through political science, yes, sir. Uh, there are two matching products there. Mm -hmm. And I think this election is a watershed because there are many turning points in history. And I can see Memphis is at the alleged of having a turning point. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is going to be a very vital election. Mm -hmm. And I want to see all, everybody, get out there and participate. Vote. If right. you hadn't voted already, get out there and vote. Right. And this election is going to require that mm -hmm. there, directly and indirectly. Directly and indirectly. Uh -huh. I'm going to go to Kyle Beasy. Right. Uh, many of you all that read the commercial appeal read Kyle's articles uh, often. And uh, one of the things I can say about Kyle since he has uh, been a part of the commercial, he is unquestionably fair. And he is very interested in all segments of our community thriving and, have prop and having proper political representation. So with that being said, Kyle, uh, you've been, you, you followed this election uh, very closely. Uh, Kyle also is a television personality on Informed Sources on Channel 3, so you have intimate, intimate detail uh, with, with this entire situation. We're going to start out with the mayor oil race. Is that okay with you all? Yes. In your opinion, Kyle, uh, you're, you're, you're a political mayor. What is your, your opinion on the political race that is what we call the mayor's race of 2015? Yeah, sure. First off, thanks for those nice words. Yeah, I appreciate yeah, we'll that. Pay me later. I'll pay you later. <laughs> <laughs> I only have a bunch of lunches now, I guess, is what I'm determined. Look, it's a close race, man. I mean, it, this race will be decided by five points either way, I've got to say, or you know, something in the neighborhood. Um, our poll, you know, we we have we commissioned the only unsigned or the only scientific poll, the only unaffiliated poll is what I meant to say, the only scientific poll, third party poll that had been done uh, all year, and we did it four weeks ago. So I mean, things change in four weeks. The news changes and all that. But when we did it, Wharton was up thirty to twenty five over Jim Strickland. And Harold Collins and Mike Williams each had 12 points. Um, I don't think things have changed to, to make a gap in that. I mean, I think it's still that tight. And I think what you're seeing is, O'Brien, well, I think we may have talked about it. Mm -hmm. It's one thing to say A.C. Wharton's got 30% and he's leading. And he right. is, and that's true. that's true. But that also says that 55% of people said they were going to vote for someone else. Yes. And it said 15% were undecided still. Right. So it's, it is unquestionable that there is a... Uh, there is a, a desire in the city for change. That's unquestionable. The numbers prove it. The question is whether that desire for change gets in front of or gets behind one candidate. Because remember, there's no runoff here. Right. If you just get one vote more than the next guy, you're the mayor. Right. And so um, that, that's what remains to be seen, right, is, is, is the, the desire to move away from the incumbent, which math has shown us exists, is that going to be enough to get 
a new mayor, and I don't know the answer. Uh, yeah, it, it's one of the tougher campaigns to prognosticate uh, for, for some of the Lemoyne students, even myself, Kyle. Uh, I got my start politically right here on this campus. When Mayor Wharton won, I mean Mayor Harrington won yeah. the uh, People's Convention back in 1991, uh, and even that was a tight race, but it, the, the dynamics were different. So, with that being said, uh, because I was a young person, you know, then it was Generation X. But let me tell you something: there is a movement in this community that is being headed by the millennials. Uh, that is something fantastic, and one of the head millennials is uh, Carlissa Shaw. I don't hate millennials, I don't know if that's the proper term, but one of the more, one of the more active millennials is uh, Carlissa Shaw. Uh, Carlissa, with what Kyle said uh, regarding uh, the closeness of this particular race, um, what is the millennial generation, this generation, thinking in regards to the mayoral race of 2015? One, um, I would have to say this often, especially when I'm speaking on panels or I'm sitting in boardrooms, is that millennials are not monolithic groups of people. We right. do not think the same. We don't have the same ideas about things. Actually, we're probably the most diverse generation of Americans that America has ever seen. Mm -hmm. So we actually defer on a number of things. Mm -hmm. um, I think that uh, in response to your first question, people are frustrated. People in Memphis are frustrated and we're tired and we want things to change. Right. But oftentimes when people are frustrated, it's hard to understand who we should, who we should be frustrated with exactly. Right. And um, it seems as if in this campaign, um, the Warden administration has taken a lot of flack for the frustrations that people have. But I believe that um, when it comes to millennials, we're a very different generation, right. and I often tell people that we've given up on politics. Right. So it's not the warden administration that people are frustrated with. We're, it's the we're frustrated with the system. It's the way it's and we're tired. We've seen our grandparents vote. We've seen our parents vote. We've seen them be politically engaged, and we haven't seen that pay off for them. Right. And so we don't participate mm -hmm. largely. Uh, the Commercial Appeal published numbers a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. I think it was, what, 3.4% of millennials have turned out for early voting. Mm -hmm. We, it's not that we don't care, we just say that the way that we've been doing things is not working. And so we're trying to do something different. So you'll see a lot of millennials who are engaged in public service through nonprofits. You see a lot of millennials engaged in business, making money, bringing business to their communities. But when it comes to politics, it's crap. Um, it's crap. Right. And, and from there, what I want to go to, I'm going to go to, yeah, give her a hand. Start out with Pearl. Pearl, Pearl Walker. I mean, she does hair. She's the hair demon, but she's one of the more fascinating individuals because she's been politically active ever since I've known her. I got to know Pearl when I was a student, um, actually when I first graduated from Lemoyne Owen College, and she's always had strong political opinions. And with that being said, she has done something that you all, that many of us can identify with. She has started a blog, and the blog is one of the most popular blogs in the city on Facebook called Memphis Raise Your Expectations. Show me your shirt, girl. Here you go. Uh, Memphis Raise Your Expectations. And many individuals uh, go on to that particular uh, blog, and they voice their opinion. And you hear a multitude of opinions on a daily basis. Um, one candidate that's running, Michael Williams, uh, is basically his campaign, even though he wasn't able to raise a lot of money, uh, a lot of online support uh, a lot because of some of the efforts that have been made in your blog, not to endorse him, uh, but many people have voiced their opinions saying that maybe he's the alternative candidate. Pearl, uh, as a person that runs that blog and, and that is extremely active on social media, Let's talk to the students about the impact of social media and politics, being a millennial, uh, with the information that we've had from Kyle in, in the 2015 campaign. Sure, let me start off by saying, um, well, I want to tell you all where I got the name from. Thank you. I want to tell you all where I got the name from. Um, when Nikki Tinker, a former congressional candidate for the 9th District, this was her campaign 
slogan, and it resonated with me, and it continued to do so, and I just thought it was a perfect name for the blog. Um, I didn't want anything negative. I wanted something that embodied the spirit of Memphis, Memphians who believe in Memphis and want Memphis to be a better place um, with their health. And so with that being said, um, as far as the impact of social media on politics in this particular race, there are many experts who felt that social media would not make a difference in politics because of the age of the people who are typically acting, interacting on social media. But as you would see, as you would know, um, people who are on social media, they are all ages. People on my blog, they are all ages. And so you get a cross section of um, ideas and thoughts and sharing. I have to um, take a moment and just thank all the people who support the page because I keep it going, but it, would, it wouldn't be anything without the people who support it. It actually has reached beyond Memphis. There are a lot of former Memphians who um, participate with the page. It allows them to keep in touch with what's going on with Memphis. They're in Knoxville, Dallas, the West Coast, the East Coast, and so it's an incredible thing that we have created with this page. I do believe that social media does have an impact like I said, a lot of people thought that it wasn't going to make a difference because of who the experts have believed were active on social media. But I know that I have someone on the page that's 72 years old. And so with the diversity of the age, and it's also diverse when it comes to race and economics. And so we have a great cross section. and. There are things that I didn't even think about to bring forth on the page, but because of the diversity of the members, we get a great cross-section. And people are interested in this campaign. They're interested in the races. They want to know about the, uh, the candidates, as well as issues that concern them and others who are also participating on the page. Uh, give a hand to Pro. Uh, and one of the things that has kind of been born out of uh, social media or what have you is <coughs> individuals that have political interests uh, that may traditionally have not had the opportunity to have a voice. Liz Rincon uh, is a young lady that I've had the pleasure to meet and, and really become a fan of. She, uh, she heads up the Rincon strategy firm. And the, thing of, the reason why I mention that is when I graduated from Lemoyne Owen uh, in the class in 1992, there was no lobbying firms around in Memphis or, or government relations firms that I had to go to. So inevitably I had some opportunities uh, to work with uh, the city council or what have you. But what Liz is doing is some fascinating work. Matter of fact, she has worked with uh, some Lemoyne Owen alumni, a uh, gentleman by the name of Cedric Wooten, that ran for judge, almost won. Uh, we've had some some others Reginald as well. Milton. He did win. Reginald Milton. He's now. Yeah, Reginald Milton, <laughs> who was county commissioner, uh, uh, who was the South Memphis Alliance. Yes. Uh, who was a Lemoyne graduate. Uh, won. She ran a campaign. Uh, which she's a fabulous person. And so what I'm going to go to now is make it a quick transition. We've been talking about the mayor's race, but what is the importance of individuals involved? like in the city council races or what have you. What is your, first, what is your opinion about some of the stronger races uh, or the more high profile races we got up? Who's the cap out here? Who's the cap? Any cappers out here? Your alum, Mikhail Lowry, is running, and I know I'm not supposed to be whatever, but I'm a Lemoyne alumni, doggone it, and I'm a school of my alum. But, but Mikhail Lowry's running for, for city council, and we've got a lot of great races. What's your opinion on all that? Um, first and most, most importantly, is that we, in the city council races, most people, and you know, I had a former state representative and a sitting judge both ask me, wait, I'm supposed to vote for city council people? If a, if a former state representative and a sitting elected judge in criminal court did not realize that they have to vote for four city, different city council people in one race, that really, that is an amazing situation. What is the average voter when they go into the poll? Uh, maybe they're going in to vote for mayor, but they have to go. They have to 
there's a 13% drop-off rate between voting for mayor and then voting for city council in your super district, and there's another 2% drop-off rate for a single member district. Uh, I know that sounds a little confusing because, well, it was designed to be such. On top of that, your city council races, you don't have a runoff in your super districts, but you do have a runoff in your single member districts if they don't get plurality. So it's just, you know, we're talking about a situation where we're looking at a minimum of four different single member districts being in runoff races. At best, we know this, that you're going to have six new city council people coming into the city council for the, the new session. Right. No matter what, who they are, doesn't matter. Yes, yes. It's going to be a turnip. Mm -hmm. You know, when you look at the mayoral race, um, you know, somebody had already mentioned that people are ex are looking for change. Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe our own government was in that feeling too, because right. so many of them decided to change what they wanted to run for right. and leave their their very safe very city safe. council seats. Right. My perspective is this: is that I'm in the, as I'm the only one up here drinking. Red Bull and not water. Uh, the, uh, in, in my perspective, you know, we look at the millennial generation, I've heard that word more times during this cycle than any other time. You're, that, the turnout rate is pathetic. It's, I mean, I'm sorry to say that in front of awesome college students, but it is pathetic. It's really actually at 0.01% if you really look at what the millennial generation is defined by. It's not really a 4%, because I think they put in Generation X yeah, into that. Yeah, yeah. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this, this election, vote, we have done a pathetic job of doing voter education towards everybody. We have. We have not, we've not put it out there, you know, your districts are changed, that your polling locations have changed, that we have collapsed 64 precincts in this city since 2011. Wow. We, have, we have purged the voter file since 2012. We have more polling locations that have been shifted and changed, and nobody even knows that. The Election Commission has done a bad job of getting that information out there. We've done a bad job of getting that information out there. And at the end of the day, the reason why the voter turnout is so bad is not because people are not engaged. It's because they aren't uninformed, and it's not their fault that they're uninformed. It's our fault. And wow. that, that is, let's give a raise a hand. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go to my brother, uh, Dr. Noel Hutchison. We're going to have him you know, speak. Uh, Chris, we're going to, I want to do something special with you toward the end. So that's cool with you. And, uh, but Dr. Hutchison, Dr. Hutchison uh, is very close to me. When I do the Brian Clay Chronicles, if you've ever seen it, uh, many times I may have to call him Dr. Hutchison to serve as a guest host. He is my brother, and I love him dearly. And one of the things about Dr. Hutchinson, he's one of the most well-read and well-respected uh, individuals when it comes to politics, not only in the city, in this country. He's a brother from New York, and I know, uh, well, see, when I was here, it was all Memphis students here in the morning, but I know that we have a plethora of people from a multitude of places uh, that come to Lemoyne Moyne College. Uh, so Dr. Hutchinson, as we Go to you, and then Burnell and myself uh, will uh, go around and ask, hey, Dr. Goldman, um, students questions, and I want you to ask tough questions. But Dr. Hutchinson, with, with all of this that's been said, and with your vast knowledge, uh, not only locally, but from a, from, a, uh, you know, from a national perspective, what do you see for the future of the body politic here in Memphis not only with the mayor's race, but with the city council races and with the city court clerk's races. And before I go on, let me acknowledge, uh, before you answer that, uh, city councilwoman and city court clerk candidate Wanda Howe. Let's give her a <laughs> One quick tidbit I will say about Wanda Howe. Who has heard about this situation with Deidre Malone? receiving the, 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 the African-American woman that received the million dollar contract. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but I'm glad the sisters got a contract. You know what I'm saying? And, 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 it, and it, in many ways it impacts Lemoyne on because, you know, many of you all will graduate real soon and uh, you're gonna be looking for a gig. And uh, I, I think it, it, it's safe to say that that resume will get a strong look from Deidre Malone 
versus somebody else that doesn't know you. So, uh, and Wanda Halbert has been on the forefront of minority and women businesses. So thank you. Thank you. Brother Hutchins, I know that was a lot, brother. You know, I got yeah. a pontificate to talk to you about. That's all right. That was a lot, but you gave me such a glowing review. Well, yes, sir. The check will be in the mail. Now, I'm going yes, to have to do you, well, to do you like Wimpy and send you the check Tuesday. So you don't have to know what that means. But, <laughs> but he, he, he was overly kind. And let me kind of share some things in terms of what I see. First of all, I'm kind of like Mr. Beasley. And I've said this on an early broadcast of your show said this on my show, I've been saying this on the radio show. Uh, the average political pundit in Memphis would say, and I have to take it here, when you have three major black candidates and one major white candidate, the pundits have said that the white candidate will win because the votes are split. What I've been saying in this race is, A.C. Wharton is going to probably win the race. It will be a close race, but he's probably going to win the race. Right. Part of the reason I say that is that Strickland has not articulated a vision that resonates with a lot of people. As a matter of fact, I think the, the interview I did, you got to see, yeah, yeah, yeah. and you see that interview, I specifically asked Strickland for his vision. Right. What would Memphis look like four years after him? And he basically said to me, well, we just need to worry about crime and blight. We're not dealing with vision right now. Right. Unacceptable answer. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing. Mike, wait, and, and let me say this, even as I give my critique, I voted already, and when I got to the mayor's race, I took a clothespin out of my pocket and put it on my nose mm -hmm. so I could vote. <laughs> well, now I'm not going to tell you who I voted for, but it doesn't matter. Any of the four, I took a clothespin out of my pocket and then voted. So I'm just being real with you. When you look at Mike Williams, if he had six more months with his charisma and with the groundswell, I think he would have a better chance. But all four candidates really have flaws and I think to speak to uh, uh, Attorney Shaw's point, mm -hmm. one of the things that happened with the mayor is when the whole thing with the budget, the 4.6% came out, he allowed other people to carry the narrative and he didn't say anything. And I told him this, his silence created an opportunity. Right. Even if he had said something and we didn't agree with it, it would have been better than for him to be silent because where there's no information, people use their imagination. Amen. And so that's what happened then. So now, here's the issue. The uh, city council is getting ready to change. The court clerk race is interesting. You have a person that can't practice law anymore that's running in the race, and some of y'all are going to vote for it. And, and let the record show. I'm just, I, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was going to say, with that being said, and let the record show that if you vote for a certain gentleman, you're not voting for him, you're voting for his son. But I, I, I was getting ready to go there too. Yeah. And now, I understand what I'm saying to you. I'm not, I know we have somebody in that race here. And I'm not being an no, advocate no, pro no, or con, no, no, no. but the truth is the truth. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Can't deny the truth. Can't deny the truth. And so, what we have to start looking at is once we get past these races, we have to look at, and there's a song in the 70s that said, and I was a former DJ, I was a mister before I was a rep. <laughs> there's a song that says, what do you do when the party's over? Well, what are we going to do? when the campaign, when the election's over. Right, right. That's the pertinent thing that we have to talk about. It's time, it's time out for being frustrated. No, we you have to do something about your right. frustration. You give a hand up. And so that's <laughs> kind of where we are. <laughs> you know, real quick, because we got to get to the students, and I know you all have a, a multitude of questions. Uh, Attorney Gerald Green, who's a professor here, uh, here at Lemoyne, how much time, 30 minutes? 
uh, Lemoyne Owen College um, with, with Reverend Hutchinson, what he said, and, we, and I want to break this up into two questions. So if you can be as brief as possible, and Chris, if you can be as brief as possible, from a economic standpoint on how it's going to affect us at Lemoyne Owen. How you doing, Reverend? John, John uh, Carnes is a, a track, we were in a track together at Lemoyne Owen right here. Um, but from an economic perspective, how is Lemoyne Owen going to be affected by this particular race? And Chris, as a small businessman, as brief as you can, because we got to get to the student, how is this race affecting what you do? The mayor's race, from, from an economic <laughs> from, from an economic aspect, I don't know if the mayor's race is going to have a lot of immediate effect. Uh, there are no <clears throat> touchstones or milestones where we can judge well if this is done by, by a certain date. If this is done by a certain date, it will improve this. Uh, I think that perhaps uh, maybe more work in the surrounding area would, would uh, improve the cycles of Lamar. But when you ask what will this mayor's race do for economics at Lamar, I don't I don't think there's it's, I don't think there's an issue. In it. You don't think it's I, an I, issue? I don't think that, that touches you're, on that. You don't think it touches it. Chris, as a, a small businessman, as quick as possible, because we want to get this too. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I think it's it's affecting the uh, student. It's affecting businesses because it's division. It's gonna have a lot of division. Just like how you just said real quick that you didn't kind of want to say or want to support a certain person. It needs to be a certain line with all businesses that whoever wins, everybody support everybody, and this all this division is leading us to no results. Yeah, Amen. Amen. Brunel Smith and I are going to kind of go around and we're going to ask questions. Brunel uh, also, well, it was a great point that was made about uh, endorsements or whatever. Brunel is, I mean, don't take this brother lightly. He is the, the CEO of the Tri-State Defender, which is our only historical <laughs> black communication that we got. have changed and, and and we've got the Kyle Veezy's and the Liz's and the and the Carlissa Shaw's doing our thing but there was a time historically that we didn't have that opportunity so what this brother is doing and and heading up that particular paper is just absolutely awesome so but with that being said uh, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to him because he's got some interesting information about what the the tri-state's gonna do about endorsements and then I'm gonna come out there if it's cool with y'all, and we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna ask some questions. What it will help if this okay. one. <laughs> <laughs> But real quick, I, I want to hit on a couple of things. Liz mentioned the uh, publicizing the district changes. This year, the election commission did. Uh, announced and they spent um, five figures with our publication to produce a four or five page layout about the district changes. And so if people wait until election day to go vote, where they're traditionally used to going voting, they're probably, they're going to get there and they're going to be disappointed. And they're going to have to run somewhere else. And as she mentioned, a lot of the confusion that's built into the system is already there. Now I will say this, we all got to take some responsibility for our ignorance, because ignorance is just a temporary state, right? It means that you have to desire to be enlightened in some form or fashion. And so what we try to do through our publication is to make sure that that information is there. So we published those district changes. We published them in print, and we published them online, and they're still available online. So, the information is there if we want to make it available to us. It's also on the Election Commission website. So we got to be active in our, in our duty. So let me say that. Relative to what Dr. Hutchinson mentioned, 
uh, today in today's edition of, of TSD, and I know we, we, we put these on the campus here, we want to make them available for students to use and to read, and I hope you are doing that. Uh, we asked the question, who should be mayor? Mm. And so we invited all the candidates in, all the four, the, the big four candidates, if you will, had interviews with them. All the candidates accepted the invitation except one, and that was candidate Strickland. Mm. He um, did not attend a forum that we held that was specifically to discuss the creation of black wealth and black business opportunity. He gave me his word that he was going to come and then he called me back at the last minute and said, well, I can't make it. We invited him in to come talk to us about our interview, uh, to interview with us for our possible endorsement, and he and his team did not respond. I say that is an indication of if this individual will basically disrespect and basically ignore black media, which is, in turn is ignoring the black community, right. just imagine what he could do as a man. Right. So this campus basically said, in my opinion, we can't, we're not going to win, we, we, can, we think we can win this race without the black vote. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's scary. Mm -hmm. That's scary for a city that's 70% African American in 2015. So, we talked to the other three candidates, and I would say, ultimately, uh, as Dr. Hutchison sort of alluded to, we, we actually decided to do a no endorsement. We just, we, we, we provided information uh, on all the candidates, uh, we assessed the candidates, uh, and ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, in talking to those candidates, we simply could not, um, we simply just felt it with it, that neither of the candidates presented uh, a vision and a platform for Memphis worthy of, of essentially endorsing one over the other. So, but what we did do is want to make sure that candidates in this edition, and it'll be online later today, there'll be information that you can read and you can decipher and understand those candidates. So with that, I know we want to get to the students because we only got about 20 minutes yes. and we want to hear from you today. So any questions you might have, any comments you yeah, might yeah, have. Yeah, yeah, comments, um, questions. Um, I, where do we want to start? Where's Professor Daniel? Uh, okay, let's start. Uh, hey, Dr. Daniel, where do you want to start, Dr. Goldman? Who do you want to start with? Journalism, students, history? I know Dr. Pace is doing some here. Uh, and, 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 and we all need extra credit, don't we? Yeah. And, uh, so, so uh, <laughs> uh, we'll start with uh, a journalism. Why, I mean, let's say, it, students, let me say this. Uh, as a college student, I, and I, I learned this lesson very early on. When you have a chance to let your voice be heard, please don't miss that opportunity. You don't know how it may open the door for you. You got influences up here on this stage. Right. So, whenever you have that opportunity, I know you get, you got your thinking. You got things on your mind that you want to express. So don't leave out this door and say, wow, I wanted to ask that question. Right then take advantage of the opportunity. Let's, let's, let's go. Let's run down. Okay. Okay, yeah. Good afternoon. First of all, I'm a Mona Pierce supporter. I'm a journalism major. I'm on the newspaper here. Hey. He's the morning on college. Okay. My question is for the whole panel. Would Campus City of Memphis be to stay viable and not go bankrupt? Mm. Uh, let's start with... We'd love to see businesses just come together and start spending with each other and start saving money with each other. It's not happening. We need something in place to where, let's just say, you know, a hundred businesses put up a hundred dollars. That's ten thousand mm dollars. -hmm. And in one year, that's one. That's uh, hundred twenty thousand. Mm -hmm. Now let's say two thousand businesses do that. You know, that's two point four million in one year. Mm -hmm. Two hundred thousand a month. That if they save that. Someone has to put something in place to let businesses start spending with each other, saying, hey, this is the working model. This is how we can spend with each other. It's too much of that, yeah, we spend 1.3 trillion. Everybody knows that. Who put something in place to say, this is what we're going to start doing with that money? Well, well and what we're going to do, too, uh, I know that was for the whole panel, but I'm going to pick pick certain individuals because of their uh, their, you know, because of their expertise. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to go to Kyle, 
uh, let him, because of, you know, your journalism major. We're going to Kyle, we're going to go to that, and then I want to go to Carlissa um, on, on that particular question as well. Well, talk to you, if you're asking specifically about the city proper, um, the, the city's financial picture is still fairly bleak. I mean, there's still a long way to go in terms of, there's a state law that says by 2020, and I could really bore you with this, but I'll give you, you know, if by 2020 you got to fully fund your annual pension payment, you're still about $30 million a year away from that. If you imagine all the, all the pain that last year involved with all those benefit cuts, that got about, I mean, if you take that, they, that those were cut and that money was spent on the pension, if, that's, if you accept that, that, that was about $25 million. So um, if you are to say, if you were to say that the tax rate is not a variable, which I'm not, I'm just saying if that's, let's say that's fixed, uh, it is really hard to do the math in terms of the city's annual budget for the next year, the next five years, um, until, until we get to a point where the city is making more money in terms of its property tax assessments. Um, the next few years are still going to be a lot of debt. I mean, a hundred and some odd billion dollars a year to the debt payments. So um, th there's a half hour version of that I won't bore you with, but it's still very, very tough in terms of the city's actual financial picture, even, even with some steps probably in the direction of solvency in the past few years that the city, uh, I guess, should be committed for if, you, if you're okay with the benefit cut, but still a long way to go. Because because of time, let's give Kyle a hand on that. Kyle, yeah. because of the time, we're just going to ask one. Just we're going to go go to one particular person. So you have a question. It could be to one specific uh, panelist. Good morning, I'm going to join you here in the morning. All right. Um, the city of Memphis is losing a lot of youth and young adults. Mm -hmm. um, there was a two-year-old toddler that was shot in the face in the Hilltree Apartments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know what proposal it takes to be put in place to regulate these kind of situations. Uh, Carlos, you want to do that one? <laughs> <laughs> I applaud you um, mm -hmm. for asking that question. That's because tough, yeah. When we talk about Memphis and what um, what one of our major problems is, is what you just talked about. And oftentimes, we don't really see it if we don't leave Memphis. I know when I lived here, I didn't realize we had a crime problem until I left and I came back. And I was like, wait, most of my friends did because I live in North Memphis or I'm from North Memphis. Um, it's a very difficult conversation to have. And when you talk about structuring a plan, it's really hard. I do a lot of criminal law, Mr. Green. I see him down there a lot. And I've tried multiple murder trials at this point. And what you oftentimes see in Memphis is you see cousins killing each other. You see um, local homeboys, people that you know. It's not really often that you have random acts of violence. Um, it, it does happen, it happens more than it should, but how do you go about helping people learn how to deal with conflict? Because that's what we're talking right, about. Right. And um, <laughs> it goes back to what your question was, we have to figure out how to invest in people. And I'm oftentimes, we talk about politics and that's what we're all here for, but I'm really difficult when it comes to talking about the faith-based community. Amen. Because there's certain things that we can't politic. There's certain things that we have to do in our own communities and there's work that has to be done and serious work that has to be done. Um, the mayor's campaign and the mayor's administration has started this blueprint for prosperity. And I looked at it, and Beverly Robinson is the best person Amen. in the whole city of Memphis to have, this, to have this project. Because when you talk about poverty and crime go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And so if we want to cut out crime, we have to figure out how to get rid of poverty and not just financial poverty, but emotional, mental, and financial poverty as well. Right, right, right. You say you're a business, go ahead, business major 2015? 2015 graduate and I'm already early voted. I went the very first day. I'm trying to see what can I do or get my friends and family to do to try to help them push towards the millennium because I know this. I posted on Instagram. Mm. I just went to work, asked people to please make sure y'all go vote, and mm. people were really just looking like that's crazy. Wow. So I'm like, what can we do, you know, to make sure our voice is free? 
So I, I know you, you, you said the millennials, but I'm going to let Liz, Liz do that because I know she worked close with the millennials as well. Uh, well, first off, you are awesome. And if yeah. everybody in your age demographic were to go out and do exactly what you just did, not by just voting for early on the first day, but also posting it to social media, which we're, we're still kind of getting a feel for how social media actually in fact, you know, impacts elections. We're in a, a testing phase with that right now. Mm -hmm. But if everybody in your age demographic did that, the city would be completely different. The mm -hmm. landscape, we wouldn't even be having a conversation about who would be mayor. Who would know? Who would know? <coughs> um, so thank you on that. But how to get involved? You know, first of all, there are candidates in, in that are sitting here right now. Whether you agree with them or not, you know, just introducing yourself to those candidates, getting, I know that they need help on their campaigns. Mm -hmm. You never, t they, okay, there's one right there. <laughs> He's in District 4, and District 4 is uh, Cooper Young to Orange Mound, uh, right, am I correct about that? Yeah, so, uh, part of it. Um, there are candidates who involved, there are issue campaigns who involved in. Uh, I believe that uh, London Lamar just came in, and mm -hmm. there she is. She is uh, the head of the Young Democrats here in Tennessee, and I know she's always looking for young talent to come in and help her with what she's doing. I mean, if you're not a Democrat, there's obviously other places you can go, but um, there are ways to get involved. And sometimes it's an uncomfortable moment to, you know, put yourself out there and actually say, like, I want to I be involved with the campaign or I want to be involved with issue work. But take that uncomfortable moment, bring a friend with you, bring your sister, bring your brother, bring your boyfriend, whatever, and take something with you. Not only does it double the strength of that organization by bringing someone with you, you can kind of uh, take that uncomfortable moment and share it with somebody else. Put yourself out there, and I guarantee you that everything will, you'll see it, you'll see change actually happen. Wow. In that, in that capacity. Let's give You're a little bit. Let's give a little bit. Yeah. John, John, can you stand up real quick? This is John Corns. He's a candidate for District 4 City Council. My favorite. <laughs> John, tell them how. Tell them that we had a cold track team. Yeah, back well, one of the best pieces all around the country, you know, good track meets. So. Yeah, we ran the same uh, heat, uh, 40 meter hurdle. So. Yeah. John, uh, yes, ma'am. My name is Carlisa Cleach. I'm a criminal justice major. All right. And my question is for the gentleman here. I wanted to know, with you saying that none of the candidates possessed or gave you a clear strategic plan about their plans with Memphis for the black community. What should we do as millennials to, I mean, you can't, we can't appoint someone, so what should we do? What steps should we take to, I'm not sure whether inform them of the needs of the young community or what we need, what the city wants or what the city needs? Well, I, I think ultimately, what we have to do is just be diligent in our communities with one another. I've always felt that uh, elected officials are only going to do so much to deal with the issues that we have, particularly in the black community. And so it ultimately boils down to uh, us getting sick and tired of being sick and tired and mm -hmm. collaborating and working together. Chris is doing some stuff mm -hmm. to uh, to bring a lot of companies and businesses to work together. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been trying to collaborate amongst uh, media outlets yes. to make sure that we have a voice that represents our interests and issues in an unfiltered way mm -hmm. directly. Uh, we've engaged young people uh, in, in a lot of ways. I mean, we got to take advantage of every opportunity that we have to change the dynamics in our community. Case in point, mm -hmm. 2002, uh, legislation was passed in the state of Tennessee to allow for the creation of charter schools. Mm -hmm. At the time, I was part of an organization called the 100 Black Men. Amen. We decided, instead of fighting against charter school legislation, we said, well, we're going to start our own school. And so for 12 years, we've been running our own school, middle school, high school, $7 million company, employing uh, hundreds of, of, of hundreds of, of teachers and educators and, and educating 800 of our own kids. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, ultimately, we just have to decide that we're going to use the tools that we have to change our plight, and then we're going to hold our elected of officials accountable. That means when, when, you know, when they don't do so, one of the things that I recommended, I didn't put so much in, into our article, but there's a process for recalling elected officials. If somebody isn't doing what we expect them to do by a certain time, if we're not getting the results that impact our community, we get the petition and we recall them. 
we, we have to just understand that there are tools at our disposal, but ultimately it boils down to this. We got to get organized. Amen. The, the, the lack of organization in our community is, uh, is the root to our, our lack of effectiveness right now. So we've got to get organized. And y'all can start organizing right here in the morning on college. Yeah. Yeah. This, this this group right here, you can you yeah. can do it. Can I take a real small piece of this? And I want to show a practical example to ask you a question. I know you didn't ask me. Let me give this free. United Against Violence 901. You know the group that had that march in white, and it was against all forms of violence. Not only the young baby that got shot in the head, but the whole Darius Stewart. Mm. Yeah. This is why I'm bringing this up so you can see how this works. This group did not exist six months ago. So preachers that knew each other got together because one of the reasons we got together, people in the community were saying that the preachers don't care, they just want to check in the big car, which is not true. There's some that are like that, but most of us are not. We got together. So now we met with the DA um, involving the Darius Stewart case. Six of us met with her talked to her in a plain way and said, you have to do something about this. We need transparency. We waited 30 days. She didn't clear her throat once but to say I'm thinking about it. So that's when we wrote that letter and then her response was, I'll not be pressured or bullied. Well, the reason she responded was because we reminded her of what we said to her and we wrote her again and that put some pressure on us. So young lady, get some of your peers together talk through a plan, be serious about what you're about, get some advice for others if you don't understand all the issues, read up on the issues and then go to work, roll your sleeves up you can do it yeah. 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 we got a, we got a, we got a situation, we're running, in, we're running into some time, yeah, five minutes so what I'm going to do is go ahead and ask questions and then just hand it to the next person so they can ask that question ask it as quickly as possible and then we'll, we'll yeah. because we're going to have to let the yeah. panel, uh, we'll, work out, uh, we'll work out the logistics. So, right. when you ask it, just hand it to, to the sister behind you, okay? My name is Christopher. I'm a business, business administration manager with a minor in African history. My question is, given our respective history as African American, and, you know what I'm saying, America, do you think our answers really lie in politics? Mm -hmm. Good what question. What you spoke on earlier about what you went through yep. about the email and what you go through as a businessman, mm -hmm. like a successful businessman, that make that day. Do you think the answers to our problem lie in politics? Are we wasting too much time waiting on votes and cents and president? Fantastic question. Yes, sir. Is he a Mr. Page yeah. Is that your suit? No, no. You got an A this year. Hello, my name is Danny Cherie, um, uh, SGA helper, i say that much. That's all right. And one of the things that we do have going on today is we have prepared, Five Baby Sigma and SGA have set up a bus on today, two buses that Ooh. take you to Glenview Community Center. So wow. you can go Give a hand. Is at two thirty until five. It'll it, be they leave on of, campus. Yes, it is on campus in front of Steel Hall, the front area. And my comment is basically, once we as a community start to realize that everything is not for us, like having two fairs a year, <laughs> and one is in South Haven, one is all the way in Germantown. Don't tell the truth. Stop, and stop. Shame helping, and Shame helping and helping and helping and and to areas that's not for us and build something of our own. Yeah. Yeah. What's your name, What's your name? Dear Cherie. Let's give her another hand. Hello, panel. My name is John Harris. I'm a senior here at the Morning on College History Major. All right. And hey. my question mm -hmm. is, we have two words, police brutality. Mm -hmm. What candidate that's running for mayor, do you, if you could answer this question, I don't know if you could. Mm. What candidate do you think that has the best the best plan to help that? I know we talk about the police getting mad about the budget cut, but this, you know, we have black men getting shot, we have stuff going on, so much crime going on, 
But they worry about budget cuts, but they're not going into how they money. So, real, yeah. real, real quick on your point, I just say this the current mayor let a contract to sign and all this stuff about Deidre Malone mm -hmm. getting an $880,000 contract. That was just a small portion of a $25 million contract that a company out of Arizona and a company out of UK primarily got the lion's share of. Mm -hmm. So, and that was for body cameras. They're going to implement body cameras for 2,000 officers. It's the largest deployment of body cameras yeah. right now in the entire country. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's being done right now. Now, whether, whether the, the policies of the other candidates, it's, it's all conjecture. It's like what, what I would do. I would just say that that process is going to help. But ultimately, what they decided was, hey, we want to educate the community about what this means, about privacy issues, about you know, if, if I'm the officer and I'm escorting you to a hospital and I got a body camera on, mm -hmm. does that violate your HIPAA rights? I mean, there's a lot of factors to this. So that's why they decided to have a, a PR campaign. But ultimately, that's something that's being done to help address police brutality and police misconduct. Okay. <laughs> I'm a journalism major and right. my question is like what can the youth do to change the mentality that our folks doesn't matter? Alright. You're a journalism major? Yes. With Miss Lay? Is it is Miss Lay oh, that she's yes. over there? She's over journalism. Alright, well give it, give her give her a hand. We're good, Ms. Lay. Yeah, so we're gonna be able to answer both of those at the same time. One of the panels wanna jump in and kind of remember that. And then we'll, 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 we'll finish up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Alicia Williams. I'm a graduating senior. Oh, wait a minute. My question is, how can we all um, educate our youth to not be historically black high schools open instead Stop of... Stop the presses. Let's give this yeah. woman a hand on Division one high schools and Division one colleges. Yeah. We're, we're going to start. That's a beautiful place. Okay. Before Brad closes, I want to ask this question because the brother, I think he had to leave. So I know y'all got class, but how many of you know somebody or have had somebody in your family who was arrested or incarcerated? Right. It's about everybody in here, right? If they had a jury trial. How did they select the jury? Mm. Well, where did that pool of people come from? It's part of their peer. It's a peer selection. It's a peer selection based upon registered voters. Registered voters. So on just that basis alone, if you if you don't register to vote, here's the thing, if you don't vote actively, what happens, Liz? They purge you. They purge you from the road, so all of a sudden you're not in the in the jury pool. So y'all, we got to understand that this whole thing is tied. It's the reason why a billionaire like Donald Trump wants to put his own money to become president of the United States. The reason why in Nashville, how much did they spend for the mayor's wife? About, about $10 million to become, collectively, to become one person to become mayor of Nashville. He became mayor again. No. No. She, 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 she's a Democrat. She but just understand, y'all, so the reason why that happens, politics it, uh, politics is, is do, do not diminish the importance of politics in our community. So, so I just wanted to make that point, y'all. We, we got to realize that there's a game, and Carissa yeah. said it best, it's a game, but we got to understand how to play it. Uh, let's do that for Brandon Smith. I will be better for Brandon Smith. He has got to talk to you. And this will be on uh, TSD Memphis. And I want to thank you. I want to thank the lady that re uh, recruited me that's right there. I see one minute. Uh, Dr. June Jointer. Uh, <laughs> Jointer. Uh, Dean Chief Jointer. That's right. Uh, uh, when I was a, a student at Lamar, or a, well, in high school, uh, I was, she found. Let's just put it that way. And uh, my life has never been the same. So thank you. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Attorney, uh, Judicial Referee, Ms. Dandridge for, for allowing us to be here. He's wrapping me up. I could go on and on. I'm a preacher's kid. 
So I'm going to stop, but I want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for, for coming out. Uh, our brother Alvin Crook with the Shelby County Dem Young Democrats is here. Uh, London, thank you. Thank you all, uh, Kimba, for coming out today and participating in this wonderful event. Give yourselves a hand and watch the Brian Show tour. And as I close all the time, if I don't see you today, I will see you tomorrow. I will see you someday. But good night, God bless, and have a fantastic day.